Lecture 1.4, Solar and Sidereal Time. So far, we've discussed motions of the night sky over the period of a day due to the Earth's spinning on its axis and a year due to the motion of the Earth around the sun. We've also talked about uh, celestial coordinate systems to uh, position uh, stars on the night sky. In this lecture, we'll look at two different ways of measuring time, uh, sidereal time and solar time. We'll also talk about precession uh, effects uh, at the end of the lecture. Okay, so a mean solar day is the time it takes from noon on one day to noon on the next day. So uh, that that duration is by definition 24 hours. So we can see that um, here we have uh, someone on the Earth who uh, is directly below the sun. So the sun would be very close to this person's zenith. As the Earth spins on its axis, it's also orbiting around the sun. So on the next day, uh, where the sun is directly overhead, uh, we can see that because the Earth has orbited around um, in, its, in its orbit a little bit, the direction of the sun relative uh, to the Earth is slightly different. This line is in a different direction than this line. So what we see is that the, the Earth has to spin a little bit more than 360 degrees to go from noon uh, today to noon tomorrow. And that's because uh, the Earth has made it a little farther along in its orbit around the sun just in those two consecutive days. This is a very exaggerated diagram. Uh, in reality, this angle here would only be about one degree. On the other hand, a sidereal day is defined as the amount of time it takes for a star to appear directly overhead one day and then directly overhead on the next day. And it turns out that's slightly different than for the sun because the Earth doesn't have to, you don't have to wait quite as long for a star that's off in this direction to be overhead. Uh, a sidereal day is defined as the Earth rotating through exactly 360 degrees. You don't wait that little bit extra for the sun to be overhead. Uh, you just want uh, you to be oriented exactly kind of horizontally in this diagram on each case. So it turns out that if you measure this, that uh, the sidereal day is about 23 hours and 56 minutes, so about four minutes shorter than a regular 24-hour day. What this means is if you look or measure very closely where the stars are night after night after night, the stars all shift slightly in the sky. Um, they're not the same position tonight as they will be tomorrow night, and that's again due to the Earth's orbiting around the sun. So can we derive a relationship between the solar and sidereal day? Here's how to do it. So we're going to define solar time as measured from a rotating reference frame of the Earth as we're going around the sun. Um, we'll define the angular velocity of the spinning of the Earth from an inertial reference frame we'll call that omega, omega SID, and SID is going to stand for sidereal, which is the astronomer's way of saying inertial. That angular velocity is just 2 pi over the period, so P sidereal is the time or the period it takes for the Earth. That's that 23 hours and 56 minutes uh, measurement that we just talked about. That's the time for the star to return to its same position in the night sky.
the solar angular velocity is the spin angular velocity of the Earth as measured in a rotating reference frame. So this is sometimes called a synodic uh, angular velocity. So by definition, P solar, the solar period is 24 hours. And the final angular velocity we're going to talk about is the orbital angular velocity of the Earth going around the Sun. And that's equal to 2 pi over the orbital period. The orbital period is about a year. Well, it's exactly a year. So 365.24 days. So these three angular velocities are related. This is basically just a statement of Galilean relativity for angular velocities. So the sidereal angular velocity is equal to the solar angular velocity plus the orbital angular velocity of the Earth going around the Sun. If you plug in for what these values are, you get this equation. If you divide through by the two pi's, you get a relationship between the sidereal period, the solar period, and the orbital period of the Earth. If we solve the previous equation for the sidereal period, uh, you can get this. So you just uh, cross multiply by the sidereal period and then divide by the other side. Uh, if we divide, well, multiply through by the solar period, uh, you can factor out the solar period here, then it appears in this next term. So if we look at the relative size of the period of one solar day, which is 24 hours, to the orbital period of the Earth going around the Sun, this is a very small, that fraction is a very small number. So one day over 365 days is very small. So we could use the binomial approximation on this term. So remember the binomial approximation says that 1 plus x to the minus 1 power is approximately 1 minus x for x much less than 1, which is true in this case. So we can write this term where we have 1 plus p sol over p orbital to the negative 1 power is simply 1 minus p sol over p orbit. So slightly simpler. If we move the solar period over to the other side of the equation, solar period minus the sidereal period is, very, is approximately uh, solar period squared over the orbital period. And so the, the solar period is exactly one day. The solar period divided by the orbital period is one day over 365 days. And now we're going to convert this day uh, into minutes. So 24 hours in a, 24 hours in one day. 60 minutes in one hour, and that gives us four minutes. So in other words, a sidereal day is about four minutes shy of a full solar 24-hour day. So again, that's where we see that we re reproduce that 23-hour, 56-minute result. So the previous argument can be generalized to any kind of uh, relative rotational motion. So let's imagine that we have, we measure uh, some kind of orbital motion, say, uh, that has a period A. This is from an inertial reference frame, so relative to the stars. A second motion, second orbital motion, uh, we'll call that period B. Again, that's relative to the stars. And We'll assume that period A is less than period B in this calculation. Period AB is the period of A as measured from B, or vice versa. It turns out it's the same. So if you go through the, um, exam the previous example, uh, you can see that that, rel that one over that relative period is just the difference one over period A minus one over period B where period A is the smaller value, so this comes out as a positive number. So here's an example to illustrate this. So find the synodic period between the two sidereal uh, periods of 6 and 4.5.
So let's assume that one planet has a period of 6, another planet has a period of 4.5, and we want to find the relative period between these two motions. So we just use that equation. We plug in 6 and 4.5 to get 18. Here's, if we want to visualize this, here's what it looks like. Uh, the first planet has a uh, period of 6. So every 6 steps here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, the planet gets back to its initial position. So we've got 3 periods of 6 here for the first planet. The second planet has a period of 4.5, so 1, 2, 3, 4, you're almost back to 1, getting back to where you started from. 5, you've gone past a little bit, so 4.5 is right in the middle. If you wait for 9 complete uh, steps, uh, you do get back to where you're from, so you've gone around twice. Um, the idea here is this period AB is telling us how long it takes the two planets to uh, return back to the same phase. So in this case, if they're starting uh, at the 12 o'clock position, uh, you're waiting for the two kind of dials on these clocks to match up again. And if you go and kind of compare them, none of these match up until you get all the way to the end over here. So it takes 18 steps uh, for them to for them to match up. And that's what this formula is telling you. Like how long do you have to wait for these two periodic signals to match up with each other? So that 18 period uh, is going from here all the way over to there. So here's a simple homework problem, uh, putting this into practice. Um, when a planet is directly opposite of the Earth from the Sun, it's said to be in opposition. So here, uh, Mars and the Earth are lined up with one another. By the way, this is the best time for us to observe Mars because it's actually closest to the Earth at this position. If the Earth goes around the Sun and it has a sidereal period of one year, Mars is going around the Sun and it has a sidereal period of 1.88 years, the question is, how long do you have to wait for the Earth and the Mars to line up again? So, very simple calculation using the previous equation. Uh, okay, so uh, final, well, next to the last topic is something called local sidereal time. So the local sidereal time is the uh, right ascension of whatever stars are on the meridian. So sidereal, again, this refers to a reference frame relative to the stars. Our regular solar time is like relative to the sun. So again, 12 noon every day is roughly when the sun is on the meridian. Sidereal time is telling us what the stars are doing, not the sun. Uh, there's a website you can go to that uh, I think you have to you have to plug in your longitude. Uh, so if you plug in uh, the longitude of Laverne, uh, it'll show you what your local sidereal time is and so you can compare this hours minutes seconds with the star chart and uh, you know whatever stars have roughly this right ascension if that's your local sidereal time then those stars are going to be high up in the sky and you'll know that it's uh, you know you could go outside and actually observe those stars the local sidereal time is also listed on the information in Stellarium. So if you click any object, um, in addition to all this other information, you'll get uh, the mean and apparent sidereal time. The apparent sidereal, sidereal time is the true sidereal time. The mean sidereal time um, assumes that the Earth is going around the sun at a constant velocity and not changing its speed. The two are very similar, so you don't, we don't really have to worry about the difference between them. But you can get the sidereal time from Stellarium. So in that last example, we saw that uh, January 1st at midnight, the site local sidereal time was about 6 hours and 52 minutes. So if you go to our star chart, 
six hours, almost seven hours. This is the line of right ascension at that, that corresponds to that time. So around midnight, January 1st, you can see that uh, Gemini is high in the sky. Uh, Canis Major is high in the sky. Orion um, is, is also up slightly setting into the west, though slightly past the meridian. Final topic is the precession of the Earth's spin axis. So we talked uh, in the first lecture about how the North Star was very closely aligned with the North Celestial Pole. Turns out that as the Earth is spinning on its axis, it, that spin axis tends to wobble just the way that a top would tend to wobble or precess. That wobbling is due to torque from the sun. The fact that the Earth is not a perfect sphere, so since it's kind of squashed out in the middle, you get torques, uh, differential torques from the sun that causes the direction of the uh, angular momentum of the Earth to uh, change in time uh, with a period of about 25,000 years. So every 25,000 years, the Earth's spin axis uh, traces out this large loop on the sky and then it'll come back to the North Star again. So um, you might notice in Stellarium or in other places that whenever folks cite the coordinates, the right ascension and declination of a star, uh, they'll always specify the epoch. And that means uh, those coordinates are going to be valid um, when at that particular time. So a very typical one is J2000. Uh, so that means uh, in, the, in the year 2000, that the RA and DEC are, are valid for that star. In 2023, uh, the Earth will have precessed a little bit, and so those coordinates will be off because the North Celestial Pole is not pointing where it was in the year 2000. So, for example, um, if you uh, look at the information on the star Betelgeuse in the information in Stellarium, it'll give you the right ascension and DEC in the year 2000 epoch, and then also on the current date. So in 2023, we've seen that uh, the coordinates have changed by you know a fraction of a degree, a very small fraction of a degree. So again, usually you don't have to worry about this, but if you're a professional astronomer and you want to very precisely locate where an object is, you have to actually take into account the precession of the Earth. So you have a homework problem uh, where you're given uh, fairly precise coordinates of a star. This is a star that uh, is known to have a, a planet orbiting it, and it's, uh, the planet's fairly similar to the Earth uh, in terms of like mass. Uh, and so uh, the question is, can you figure out which star that is? Can you find the name of the star by looking up these uh, precise coordinates using the, um, the J2000 epoch? Uh, and the way, by the way, that you could do this, if you uh, open up the search window in uh, Stellarium, you can use a little magnifying glass, or I think you can type in Control or Command F, then you can actually just type in the right ascension and declination uh, to try to go to those precise coordinates. Okay, so that's it. Um, this is the end of the first unit, and we'll be talking about uh, celestial mechanics in the next lecture.